Half Days on Tiro, welcome to our Decision 2024 coverage ahead of the CNMI Republican Party Delegate Primary. We are joined with both candidates, Kimberlyn King Hines and John Gonzalez. Welcome to you both. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having us, Tomas. Jesus Masi, thank you. And so our viewers have had the chance to listen to you both in our separate interviews that we've done. And now we're joining forces today to give the voters a chance to hear a conversation between the both of you ahead of the delegate primary for the CMI Republican Party. And so uh, I'll just start with asking how the past few weeks have been and how you guys are preparing for the primary. You wanna go ahead? Go ahead, please. Well, um, a lot of it, right, is just engaging with the community, having different conversations uh, with different folks from different backgrounds in terms of, you know, what it is they think uh, the role of the delegate is. And I think one of the challenges that I've been facing in terms of just speaking to the public, whether it be si Tun Jose or si, Tun Jose, or si Jose Jr. or Jose the Third, right, is that one, there's no clear understanding of what actually the role of the delegate is and how the delegate can help the people and the economy of the CNMI. So that's one. Um, I think that, a that that is a challenge that I think that we that we all collectively need to overcome in terms of getting more awareness yes. about what the actual duties are of the delegate. Um, but other than that, man, uh, I've been having such a great time. I'm going to be honest, Tomas. Um, I'm living my best life, and I love meeting people. I love having community engagements. I ha I love having conversations uh, with people and trying to get their perspective right of you know what the issues are that impacts them the most yes. and so no matter what happens with the primary um, I have been so blessed and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be to be able to have this community engagement and for you John I she said everything exactly the same um, uh, it's quite humbling really just gratifying yeah uh, to be one of their fellow citizens uh, to come out and, and volunteer uh, I've essentially retired. Uh, I've been debt free with my mortgages and my cars and stuff. And life is good. And like my sister, uh, who I really respect much, uh, knew I've been enjoying life. Life is but too, too blessed to be stressed, quite frankly. And, you know, just every day I, I wake up to debriefings, uh, you know, um, FaceTimes with our sons. Uh, and uh, speaking of, uh, you know, just two days ago, uh, we found out uh, that the, our youngest, the third in our, of our sons, just got accepted again, direct admissions to the Coast Guard Military Academy. And so we're very excited, truly, truly blessed. The campaign has been so, uh, wow, fun, enjoyable, and the people are, their, their spirits are up. And it's our privilege to come and visit them in their homes uh, with their renewed desires and aspirations for a brighter future. And when we leverage our covenant, when we leverage our lands, Tinian, two thirds of Tinian and our islands and ocean, that we pledge to bring better prosperity, sustainable living for our people because it's the only American thing to do and it's unacceptable to keep the status quo. And we're excited in this journey together with my sister, my fellow Republican, uh, Kim uh, King Hines. I wanted to just jump right into uh, the question that many voters might have after the primary. I wanted to ask you both, if you don't uh, win the primary, will you support the other candidate and not run as a third party candidate or as an independent candidate rather? I will say unequivocally that I will support whoever wins the primary. I think, you know, uh, what we're focused on is building, rebuilding the economy, uh, focusing on actually figuring out what it means to be self-governing. We're focused on defining what it means to have a quality of life here in the CNMI and some of the policy uh, objectives that I have in terms of pursuing uh, this path is to redefine or, or define what that means exactly for the people. Um, and you know, no matter who the nominee is, um, that is what I'm focused on. I'm not necessarily focused on getting elected myself. I'm focused on pursuing um, that goal. And if it's John, 
I will be behind him 100%. And uh, he's also pledged that if, if it, it, it is me, that um, he will do the same. Yes. And speaking of which, let's do this together and let's yeah. rock and roll. Yeah. Yes. I wanted to talk a bit about how you've been outreaching to the voters. Uh, John, when we first spoke, you mentioned you've been doing a door-to-door -door campaign. And Kim, I just can't help but notice your social media presence. Um, so is that part of your strategy? Or how are you reaching out to voters, particularly maybe even younger voters in the Republican Party who will be heading to the polls for the primary? So going back to the conversation that I, I've, I've been having, right? Um, you know, I, I, I meet with people and you, when you start talking about, for example, labor issues, immigration issues, Medicaid issues, and you, you start getting into the specifics of what the, the Wagner-Pazer Act or whatever laws that, are, that, that need to be amended, right? Um, people, that, that kind of stuff goes over their head. What people really care about, right, is, is how that's gonna impact their lives and improve their lives on an individual basis. And so um, the biggest unregistered voters the, the, dem the, the biggest demographics of unregistered voters is the age of 18 to 25. You know, they just feel disenchanted with what's happening. And um, what I've learned in my conversations with the thirds of this world, as I'm gonna call them and, and classify them, is that we need to find a better way of connecting with younger voters to get them engaged. Because after all, why are, why are we doing this? I'm doing this to Moss because, you know, in the conversations with my 20-year-old daughter, her response is, I don't know if I'm gonna come back home because what are the opportunities there for me? So what I'm trying to do basically is build a future, a place, a commonwealth that she wants to come home to after she's done pursuing whatever professional goals that she has. Um, a lot of folks within the 18 to 30 demographics, they're struggling, you know what I mean? We're just starting up, trying to get new homes, um, trying to, get to, to level up their qualifications. You know, how do we find ways to get them to engage, to be able to, to participate in this decision-making process so they can help shape the future that will impact them the most? And so um, I, have, I, I am focused on, on putting out a lot of social media content with the hopes basically, right, that I reach out to those younger demographics who are going to be the ones who are gonna be impacted by the policy decisions that we're making today. Right. I'm on the downward trajectory of my life. I'm about to be 50 next year. So pretty much I'm like knocking, knocking on heaven's door at this point. Right. And so um, I'm focused on the future, not for me, but for these younger folks who um, are going to be here and hopefully will be taking care of me at the Manamku Center. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, exactly the same. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, in my conversations with the people, uh, in fact, yesterday I had another gathering uh, of families who were graciously offered their place, their home, their farm. Uh, and uh, wow, it was really, really um, just how, how it's validating that majority of the attendees were the young voters. Uh, demographics 18, and those who are going to be 18 uh, before November 5th of this year for the midterm elections. Uh, up to about 32, 33, because I did a sort of like a, uh, what's your age or what's your gap and stuff. And, and, and Kim is correct. We need to uh, engage and how do you say, go down with them in terms of understanding. What is the role of a NMI delegate to Congress? What is the covenant? Uh, how significant are we in terms of our land as remote as we are, and our ocean to the United States uh, international defense posture in the greater Indo-Pacific region with uh, no, no security. I mean, Guam uh, is obviously the main base, but we need to make sure that we, whatever we decide on Tini and, and our islands and our oceans, uh, that we leverage it to make sure that we ensure a better quality of life, a brighter future, and more benefits and programs that's equalized for our incoming generation because that's the promise of our covenant and it was the pledge of the United States and the Northern Marianas as covenant negotiators when they executed that in goodwill and with due diligence and in good faith. And I look forward uh, to doing exactly the same. And one of the areas actually is section 904 of our covenant. When the United States promised uh, to include the Northern Marianas 
in all of its trade and tourism and uh, missions, uh, and investment trade and manufacturing, social, political, economic forums and organizations to include us. We need to do a better job with that. We, we want to say as your delegate, as, as our delegate to the United States, that we need to have the United States, please. No, this is, we are US citizens and we deserve equal uh, uh, rights and privileges uh, to avail of those access uh, to leveling up our economy because that's the only way forward. Kim, did you want to add to that? I, I feel as though uh, both of your cam campaigns have made it a point to point out uh, you know, our covenant. Right. Um, so when our forefathers executed the agreement, the, the covenant, we exercised our right to self-determination. One of the things that I feel uh, we need to improve on and work on is figuring out for ourselves what does self-government mean. And for me, um, you know, I want an economy, I'm not looking for a federal handout. I'm looking for a hand up, right? Um, the difference in terms maybe in just the word that we use John mentions the word equal. I'm not looking for equal. Because if we're looking for equal, I think what we're saying is we want one size fits all policies. And it is very clear that these one size fits all policies simply do not work. What I'm looking for is parity. And I'll give you a classic example of parity. A dollar in Saipan is very different than a dollar in Rhoda, right? The value of the dollar in Saipan is a dollar. When you go and take that dollar and spend it on Tinian, it's very different. You spend it in Rhoda, oh my gosh, you know what I mean? It's cost prohibitive. I, I don't even know how our brothers and sisters in Rhoda are able to make it at this point. Um, and so what I'm looking for basically is parity in terms of policies. Um, but more importantly, I'm looking for the ability to change policies that will allow us to be able to be self-sustainable. Yeah, and, and if I may uh, know exactly when I say equalized benefits, when my dad was in Oregon and in Las Vegas for part of the year, uh, a couple of years ago, actually pre-pandemic, he was receiving Social Security uh, benefits. Uh, he was receiving uh, Manomco senior citizen benefits. He was receiving food SNAP benefits, much higher than what we would, uh, he would get here. He got back and all of those benefits and programs stopped. Uh, and that's what I mean, is that uh, the cost of living, and I like how Kim used that analogy, that a dollar here is not the same as in Luta Tinian. The dollar in the Northern Marianas, let's, let's put Rhoda as the most cost prohibitive. We need to do a better job by achieving that parity. A dollar in the Marianas is maybe five, six times higher than what it would cost if you are uh, living in the United States mainland. That's what we need to is to equalize those benefits because when my dad was getting it, why is he not getting it here when we are the U.S. citizens and he was getting it as a U.S. citizen in the States. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to achieve equal benefits, tweak those policies, be proactive, be productive in making sure that we revisit those policies because we deserve no less. We deserve better and that we must achieve equal benefits. On top of that, uh, in the words of Kim, achieve parity because the cost of living, the consumer price index, and uh, the gross domestic product is much, much different here than anywhere in the mainland US. For my next question, I invite you to reframe my question and answer it in the way you'd like yeah. to answer, but uh, I have to ask a question for you to answer it in the first place, so here it is. Um, when uh, Republican voters uh, go to the primary, they're going to st stand with that piece of paper in their hand and it's going to say Kimberlyn King Hines or John Gonzalez. Why should they vote and tick off your name and not the other name? I'll let you go first, John. <laughs> I've been going first. So. Yes, obviously. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know what? First of all, it's, it's an open primary. Uh, I made sure and I spoke numerous times with our president, Diego Benaventi, and of course, to relay, convey respectfully to the executive board of uh, the NMI GOP party. And of course, uh, our NMI Republican elected officials uh, to make sure that we do not unnecessarily undercut and uh, shortchange the inalienable rights of every registered voter here in the Northern Marianas, number one. 
and that's why I, I'm so uh, glad that the, the GOP board is allowing an open primary uh, to please come and vote for either my sister Kim or myself. And I would like to um, uh, simply say this. I will be amongst other category of issues, your economy delegate. First and foremost, how can we thrive and survive in this you know, stagnating economy? We've never had uh, you know, the, the, the heydays of the 1980s and 90s with almost a million uh, tourism visitors, tourist visitors to the islands when our gross domestic product was achieving so high together with our exports of island apparels made in the Northern Marianas up to a billion, a billion. Now we hardly reach even half of that, not even a, a third of that. We must revive our economy and we must tweak those policies and those issues and we must do, go back to basics. Do first things first. Is we need infusion of manufacturing, of tourism, of the kind of visitors that we need for our ge geopolitically different community and, and, and region. Uh, we're surrounded by Japanese tourists. We're surrounded by Chinese tourists, by South Korean tourists. And if the United States is able to hand out hundreds of billions to Ukraine, to, to uh, Israel, then I think it's incumbent upon the United States to subsidize uh, U.S. Uh, air airlines that are serving direct flights from Japan, China, Korea to Saipan, Luta, Tinian, and subsidize that because, in fact, <coughs> during the pandemic, the United States government was subsidizing all U.S. American made and, and, and no, no owned airlines throughout the pandemic. So they were not losing. Why? Because it was American to make sure that the economy keeps afloat, the multiplier effect continues, and that there's no, uh, no, no unnecessary monkey wrench or disruption in the economy. That's what drives countries. That's what will drive our islands to greater prosperity. So I'm going to be your economy delegate. We need to fix our hospitals. I will ask for infrastructure funding so that we can equip our hospitals, Luta, Tinian, and Saipan, with the latest medical technology. What good is our hospitals when we don't have uh, we, with the best new doctors when we don't have the adequate medically uh, no needed equipment? Uh, and number three, our CUC rates are so high. It's, it's, it's really sadly very, very uh, no, no painful for all of us. Uh, and I will ask for infrastructure funding. We need to go back to basics to MAS. And we must work with our leaders, hands down. After the election, we must work together because our people are suffering, losing jobs, r reduction in hours, and our middle income and our young people graduating with so much promise are in this. Uh, not a uh, safety net that's really not safe for our people and us. And I pledge that we'll do everything we can within all the powers and will of the covenant and, and leveraging our, uh, our ocean and land for the U.S. military no, no defense posture and get the rights that we must need, not by getting a hand, uh, handout, but a hand up because it's the only right thing to do. Thanks. Thanks. So, you know, one of the things that the Democrats had right, had right that I agreed with uh, was when Congressman Kilili uh, was up for re-election and folks were saying hey we need to keep Congressman Kilili in there because of the relationship that he's built right um, and I absolutely agreed with that argument because in order to be able to accomplish a lot of the things that we're talking about you need to build relationships um, I'll say this I've established those relationships and I've already, I'm already, I, I have my foot, more than one foot in the door with regards to our federal partners. Um, and I'm glad he brought up the example, for example, of the ARPA COVID, uh, the CARES Act relief that was provided to the airports. Um, you know, as soon as we made the decision to ask the airlines to shut down the tourism industry, I knew that that would have a rippling adverse effect, not just in the ports, but across the entire Commonwealth. And what I did, Tomas, was not just sit down. I actually um, put pen to paper and reached out almost on a daily basis to our federal partners, specifically the FAA. 
uh, telling them about the conditions and what this would mean basically not just to the port's su su uh, sustainability but to the economy in whole and you know a year you no know, two years after we were able to actually have the annual FAA meetings the port's authority because of those efforts was credited actually to be the inspiration of the CARES Act because actually it was the Marianas who first started waving the flag and saying hey if this is happening here in the Marianas, what do you think is going to happen across all the ports in America? And so I have an email that specifically, you know what I mean, gave the Ports Authority kudos because of those efforts. In terms of leveraging our military partnership, tomorrow I'm heading down to Tinian to meet as the Secretary of Air Force. The conversations that we're having today is specific to logistics and how the impact that this military footprint is having on the economy in general specifically labor. You have all these construction activities happening down on Tinian. Well, where are you gonna get that labor supply? To top it off, when you're sucking up all the available labor on the island, what does that do basically to the average ordinary Joe who's just trying to build their first home in terms of cost? And so how do we, right, instead of screaming at each other, how do we sit down, collaborate, and work out a solution to figure out how to address a mutually beneficial, um, to, to create a, a mutually beneficial policy. And so um, I think, you know, that would be the difference between myself and the other candidates. I'm already doing it. It's what I've been doing for the last 10 years. And it's through my involvement at the Ports Authority and through my involvement with the military, um, the ongoing military organizations, uh, I'm sorry, um, movement in the Marianas. All right. Uh we're coming up to the end of our conversation, so I just wanted you to give a, uh, give both of you a chance to uh, now directly address the voters um, with your message as they prepare to make a decision Go in ahead. a couple of days. Go ahead. You know, first of all, I just want to say thank you very much for graciously um, opening your homes, for having meaningful conversations with me in the past couple of months, actually since even before my announcement, um, you know, I hear you, and uh, unlike John here, um, I'm not debt free. Uh, I had to self-finance college. I'm knee deep in debt to pay for my bachelor's, my master's, and my law degree. And so, you know, in the conversations that that I've had with with you know grandmothers, uh, mothers and fathers, and now kids trying to come up, you know, I think that we, we share very similar stories and. Um, why you should vote for me? Well, um, I think that the time is ticking in terms of um, getting the CNMI in a situation where we could be in a situation where we can help ourselves. Um, you have two great quality candidates before you uh, that's running under the GOP primary. Uh, I do believe that John is very passionate and he's as equally committed um, to helping and serving the people. He's a great father uh, and he's, you know, represented our community well in various organizations. And so um, obviously it's up to you. Your voice is, your, your vote is your power and whatever you decide, although I would like for you to vote for me, whatever you decide, um, for me, this is not about the delegate race. Uh, this is a commitment to seeing the Commonwealth move in a direction where we see a sustainable government and so um, whatever happens the delegate seat is not the be-all end-all for me for me this is a movement I'm trying to create a new generation of up-and-coming leaders to want to participate and uh, which I think is far more important than anything else because well we just need everybody's help and um, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity Thank you, Kim. Um, obviously, uh, you know, just, just so humbled. Uh, first of all, I want to obviously salute and commend you. Uh, this is uh, such a privilege to be running with you under the GOP party and have nothing but utmost respect uh, and admiration for you. Uh, and, 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 you know, we're, we're coasty family, so yes. yes. And, and we wish obviously nothing but the best for your daughter, our Northern Mariana's daughter, because she's got so much passion as well and uh, a great future and promise. And I look forward to uh, ho hopefully uh, participating in those, her culinary uh, new, uh, newfound uh, career. We're excited about that. Um, 
manyelo zan manyay nahu sumen humidizo zan mampusin patsazo uh, olumay remi uh, aramasash meril uh, luta chilyan meril slesepen zan kurulonya especially our young voters ages 18 to 35 the future is bright for all of you take it from both of us we've been there we've done that and we know and we have the experience of 10 20 years i have worked 30 years for the government and like kim uh, we have achieved much accomplishments for the direct benefit of our people. Uh, for example, I was hired by Housing to uh, write from scratch, research and lead uh, the team up at Housing with uh, Jeannie and Jesse and Jeff uh, in writing the first ever in the entire Pacific region, Hawaii and Guam included, uh, the CDBG disaster recovery. And it's so gratifying, so validating to see and hear of homes being built Luta, Tinian, and Saipan after the uh, no, typhoon uh, Sodalor and, and, and U2, and of course Mawar uh, for uh, no, permanent sanctuaries and homes for our people. That's one example of what it means for me to work for you because it's nothing. I sleep good at night because we do and we did what was right. And uh, I have nothing but much respect to all of you. I uh, pray that uh, when we go into that voting ba uh, ballot, uh, it's an open primary, that you, you think of me when my wife passed away in 2015 after Sodalor. I had back-to-back -back funerals. My brother died uh, on November uh, 10th. Two weeks later, my wife passed. I dropped everything, and I said, I need to focus on what matters, my father and especially our three sons. I gave them a thousand percent of my time and love and dropped everything and my wishes and my desires because they needed a father slash a mother. And I will pledge to give the same love and respect and pinitizi to all of you uh, when we come to this primary election. And whoever wins, I pledge to support because failure is not an option. Jesus Masi. All right, thank you both, John Gonzalez and Kimberlyn King Hines, for your time. Thank you for joining us, and we'll have more coverage on KUAM.com. My sister. Thank you. Love you.